Definitely. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak with you all. I, I, uh, I'm really curious to hear what you guys uh, think about this um, data. Okay, so I'm interested in how the brain is able to use cues in the environment to make predictions of future events and how these predictions are used to guide behavior. So typically, many different features of a potential outcome must be weighed when making decisions. Probability, confidence, time, effort, benefit, whether caloric or nutritive. Assuming all else being equal, let's consider a choice between an M&M and a Skittle. Um, depending on food preference, some people would pick the M&M, while others would pick the Skittle. Yet if we slowly started increasing the number of M&Ms available, Presumably, almost everyone would shift over to selecting the M&Ms. So my recent uh, work has really focused on addressing this question of how different dimensions of outcome information are integrated in order to make appropriate and rational decisions between qualitatively uh, disparate options. So to do this, I've developed an economic choice task in rodents, which is very similar to chem uh, Camilla Padua-Sciopa's task in non-human primates. Um, essentially, we, it's uh, basically the same design as that task, yet uh, because rats don't have very strong color vision, uh, we use, instead of using color to indicate food type, uh, we use uh, stimulus shape. And to indicate the amount of food available, we indicate uh, that through segmentations of this, uh, uh, the symbols. So basically, for those of you not familiar, familiar with uh, Camillo Padua-Sciopo's task, um, within this task, rats need to integrate information indicating the amount of food available with the information about food type in order to make appropriate decisions. So on the left side here, um, this shows a panel of uh, a rat performing the test. This shows a single trial. Rats are in the conditioning box. They hear a white noise cue, which tells them they need to nose poke at a center nose poke in the box. Um, they have to hold that nose poke for about a second. And then um, two screens come on uh, with either with two different options. Uh, the rats then must hold the nose poke for another second. And the white noise turns off and the rats can make a decision by pressing one of the screens. Uh, these are all the different stimuli that uh, rats might experience over the course of a session. And uh, this is an example of uh, behavior on the choice task. So on the x-axis is are the different offers of the number of pellets of food B to the number of pellets of food A. So that if you look down here in the lower left, um, these are trials in which the animal was offered zero pellets of food B and one pellet of food A. And you can see that the rats choose food B 0% of the time uh, for these trials. Now, as we move across the x-axis, the ratio of pellets of B to pellets of A increases. And you can see at some point, the animal switches over to choosing B 100% of the time. Um, we can fit a sigmoidal curve on this behavior. And where this uh, sigmoid crosses the 50% line, we refer to as the indifference point. And we can use this indifference point as an estimate of the animal's preference for the two foods. In this case, the rat preferred food A to food B by about 2.6 times. So this shows the uh, choice task menu and the different cues that all of the animals experience. Uh, these are the different foods in order of um, average or objective preference. Each of the rats have their own subject subjective preferences and um, the ordering might be different uh, depending on different rats. Uh, so each rat learns uh, food cue associations. These are counterbalanced across rats. And these uh, uh, cue outcome associations are held constant over the course of the experiment. Uh, so this is a, a static task. There's no, nothing changing in the associations um, across the course of this uh, behavior. So as I mentioned before, the number of segmentations of the symbol indicate the uh, amount of food. And the, um, as I just mentioned, the, the stimulus shape indicates food type. Uh, we did uh, keep the luminance constant across all of these uh, stimuli. And uh, this shows a rat performing the touchscreen task. 
So the rat has to uh, nose poke at a center nose poke. They have to hold for a second. Uh, they can then make uh, press the screen to make a decision. And in this particular example, the rat prefers uh, the food associated with crescents over the food associated with triangles. And you're going to see on the next trial, the rat's going to pick one cr crescent over about four triangles, indicating this preference. And the rat does this um, consistently over the course of the session, uh, indicating this preference. So uh, Camillo Padwaskiopa um, had shown that monkeys uh, display transitivity behavior on this canonical economic choice task. Um, and this means that monkeys uh, choose consistently or have consistent preferences across multiple uh, food types. And it turns out that rats also display transitivity. And to, uh, to better explain what I mean by this, uh, if we give rats three different pellet types over uh, three sessions for three days, um, we can look at how consistently they choose across uh, these three pellets. So on the first day of behavior, uh, if we give animals pellets A and C, uh, the, in this example, rats, the rat preferred A to C by about 1.7 times. And in the second day, uh, this rat preferred A, food A to food B by about 1.7 times. And if the rats are choosing con, uh, consistently uh, across these foods, uh, by this transitivity rule, uh, the rat should consider B and C to be about equivalent. In this example, it, it actually turns out that way. So we can plot this behavior on a um, transitivity plot. Here, the indifference point for the most to least preferred pellet is plotted on the y-axis. And the product of the other two indifference points is plotted, plotted on the x. So you can see in our example here where we had 1.7 for the most preferred to least preferred, and the product of these other two indifference points uh, you can see it falls very close to the identity line on this plot. Uh, here the identity line represents perfect transitivity. So you can see for this particular example, um, the rats are showing very close to uh, perfect, this rat is showing very close to perfect transitivity. So we can plot this for many animals across many triplets of uh, sessions. And you can see that overall, uh, rats show behavior very close to this identity line. And in fact, if we scramble or shuffle the labels uh, within each triplet, uh, these points fall significantly farther away from the identity line, indicating that the rats do show uh, significantly uh, transitive behavior. So now that we had this task in hand, um, we wanted to first try to look at um, how this task is, uh, uh, depends on orbital frontal cortex. So orbital frontal cortex had, has been um, well described in economic decision making, and many of the uh, uh, much of the evidence for orbital frontal cortex in economic decision making, or at least this type of the economic decision making that that I'm talking about, um, has come from electrophysiology studies. There haven't been many causal studies showing that orbital frontal cortex is required uh, for the economic orbital frontal cortex is required for economic choice. Rather, neural correlates of economic value have been observed in orbital frontal cortex in this uh, static form of economic decision making. Um, this was true at the time when we first started this experiment. So we wanted to causally test whether um, or orbital frontal cortex is in fact involved in economic choice. And to, to first do this, um, we wanted to look at uh, whether orbital frontal cortex is required specifically for well-trained well -trained economic decision-making, uh, behavior in which these uh, neural correlates of economic value had been observed. So we set out to do this. And at first, we weren't quite sure what would be predicted by this idea that OFC encodes economic value if OFC were inactivated. So we thought our strongest hypothesis was that if OFC is in fact required for integrating multiple features in order of different options in order to come up with the appropriate value, that when we inactivated OFC, we would see um, animals choosing randomly 
And this would result in a flattened curve of a uh, flattened psychometric curve on our economic choice test. Um, another possible uh, theory we came up with is that orbital frontal cortex might be um, specifically important for computing the specific expectation of the food types that are available. Yet animals would still be able to choose based on the number of uh, pellets available. In this case, we would expect rats to consider the two food types equal since they don't have outcome representations to pull up to determine the specific values, but they would still be able to choose based on number. So we'd see no effect on slope in this case, but we would see the psychometric curves shift to uh, a one-to-one -one indifference point. Finally, we thought, well, there's another possibility that we wouldn't see any effect on any individual session, but that we'd see this loss of consistency of choice behavior across sessions. So to go back to that transitivity plot, we would, in this case, we'd expect to see these dots falling farther away from this identity line when we inactivated OFC. In this case is represented by an increase in variance uh, around this identity or perfect transitivity. So to do this, uh, we used optogenetics. We bilaterally inhibited OFC. We had two, uh, two groups, an uh, experimental group, which we refer to as the HALO group, and a control group, which we refer to as the EYFP group. So we injected an AAV virus containing HALO rhodopsin fluorescent protein into the HALO group and uh, an AAV virus containing only fluorescent protein protein into the EYFP group. This shows the extent of our spread, and this shows an example of the viral spread. So now we could place fiber optics above the injection sites so that when we pass green light down into the optic fibers, we could inactivate or orbital frontal cortex through inhibition of a light-sensitive chloride pump. Yet in our EYFP group, this would presumably have no effect on orbital frontal function. And finally, these are just the uh, sites of our optic fibers. Okay, so to get, at, to get to the results, our first prediction was that we'd see a reduction in the slope. And here I am showing you the histograms of the inverse slopes for all of our control groups and experimental groups. So this top row is the EYF behavior of the EYFP group. Bottom row is the behavior of the HALO group. Because these are subjective, uh, we're looking at subject subjective preferences, we also wanted to have a control, a within animal control. So we had two fiber types that we connected the animals to. So some sessions, the rats got a blocked fiber. These are cables that come down to attach to the uh, ferrules on the top of the animal's head where the light is blocked at the very tip so that light can't go down into the brain. And the patent fibers have uh, optic fibers that allow light to pass down into the brain. So we had this control as well. And finally, there was a third control in that we only inactivated on 50% of the trials or turned the laser on for only 50% of the trials within these sessions. So uh, as I mentioned, this is all control data. This is our control, uh, these are our control sessions for the HALO group. And finally, in this bottom right panel, this is our experimental group where we're in fact allowing light to pass down into the brain on these yellow uh, laser on trials. So what we were expecting to see was a rightward shift of this yellow histogram to uh, reflect a flattening of the slope. Yet we saw no difference between the, uh, the two histograms or as compared to any of the other control groups. So the second hypothesis we had was that we would see a shift in preference. And this would be uh, a shift in the indifference point, but not the slope. Again, I'm showing you histograms of the indifference points. Again, the bottom right is our experimental control group. And in this case, we're expecting to see the histogram leftward shift to a one-to-one -one indicating a loss of uh, the ability to, of rats to use specific representations of the, uh, of the stimuli. And we saw, again, saw no difference here. 
And finally, we also looked at uh, transitivity uh, and consistency of choice across multiple food types. Just to reacquaint you with these plots, I'm plotting the most preferred to least preferred pellet on the y-axis here, the product of the other two indifference points on the x-axis. Here, the identity line represents perfect transitivity. And as you can see down in this bottom right panel, um, rats did not, when we inactivated OFC, rats did not show uh, any increase or loss of the ability to display consistency and choice for transitivity. In fact, if anything, behavior became more stable or more consistent across uh, while when OFC was inactivated. So when we finished this experiment, we were pretty surprised by these results. Um, and the first question we had was, well, are we inactivating OFC strongly enough to get a behavioral effect? So we took these same rats and we put them in a Pavlovian devaluation task, which is a task that is known to be um, important uh, to be OFC dependent across species. And we, we ran the animals on the task. We found uh, a significant behavioral effect that looked just like uh, the results that you would get with lesioning orbital frontal cortex. So we, in fact, were inactivating OFC strongly enough to get a behavioral effect um, on devaluation, but we were, still, we were not seeing any effect on the economic choice task itself. So I'm not going to show you that data of the Pavlovian devaluation because we have now done reinforcer revaluation on the choice task itself, which I'm going to show you next. But first, another possible explanation for not seeing any effects on economic choice in well-trained animals is that it's possible that the behavior had become habitized. We thought this was unlikely. Rats get, uh, have six different food types that they're choosing between. They might be on any given pair on any day. Um, and rats might not see a given pair for about a week or so. We, we thought that it was unlikely that this behavior could habitize, but we wanted to test this. So we used uh, reinforcer revaluation to try to get at this question of whether uh, this task is goal-directed or not. So um, we use sensory-specific satiety to do this. Uh, this, this method allows, uh, allows for a revaluation of a food without permanently changing the value of that food, such as uh, lithium chloride or conditioned taste aversion does result in a more permanent uh, devaluation. Uh, so we stuck with the sensory specific satiety. So this amounts to pre-feeding a, a food type before uh, measuring behavior and presumably prefeeding a food type, uh, a specific food type, or sating an animal on a specific food results in a, a, de a temporary devaluation of that food. So our experimental design was on the first day of behavior, we put rats back on a pair they hadn't seen in a while, and we acquired uh, a baseline preference for those two foods. Uh, to do this, we measured their indifference point pre-satiety. Then on day two, we brought the animals into the room. We gave them two hours access to one of the food types. And then immediately following those two hours, we put the animals into the box and let them run on the economic choice task to determine a preference following specific satiety. So in this example, because bacon is the prefed pellet, uh, this typically results in a devaluation or a reduction in value of bacon. And what we'd expect to see is a shift in preference for this uh, grape pellet. Okay, so this is, these are examples of behavior, behavior following prefeeding. And what I'm plotting here in each of these examples in black is the day one behavior, in blue is the day two behavior. And you can see that there are less offers uh, given on day two. This is simply because the rats uh, don't do as many trials on day two. And also, when you're doing this type of uh, uh, revaluation to get at the question of goal-directed behavior, it's, it's ideal to do this in an extinction test, although in this, um, this type of behavior that we're using here with this economic choice test, it's, it's basically impossible to do this in an extinction test. 
it's possible that animals, once they don't get any rewards from one stimuli, they might switch over to the other. So our strategy was just to use a minimal number of trials to really see if the behavior is shifting immediately from the start of the session. So using this, these lower number of offers would also help us really focus on to determine whether the indifference point was shifting uh, from day one to day two. So surprisingly, we saw many different directions in the shift following sensory specific satiety. We saw preference shifts toward the prefed pellet, which was opposite of what we had expected to see. We saw no shifts in preference, and we saw shifts in preference away from the prefed pellet, uh, which is you know, what we were expecting. This would be consistent with a devaluation effect. So at first we took this to mean that that the animals had habitized on this behavior. We, we were sort of surprised at that. But then we realized that it's possible that these shifts in preference might depend on the baseline food preference of the two pellets. So meaning that in this example, we prefed bacon, but bacon might be the preferred or not preferred pellet in this, in this decision. So we decided to look at how the changes in preference depended on the baseline preference. And that's what I'm showing you here on this plot. If you look on the x-axis here, uh, these are the baseline preference from day one. The y-axis shows the shift in difference point from day one to day two. And in fact, when we just look at sessions in, in which we prefed the non-preferred pellet, we actually saw uh, this consistent devaluation effect. These gray dots here towards the middle are sessions in which they didn't have a significant preference for either pellet. Now, interestingly, when we looked at uh, sessions in which we prefed the preferred pellet, um, most of the sessions showed a preference for the, uh, for the prefed or preferred pellet following uh, uh, prefeeding. We refer to this as the appetizer effect. Um, we, we got this name from Peter Holland, who had actually observed this effect in the past, although he never ended up publishing it. So in essence, we, had, we ended up with a significant correlation between the shift in preference and, uh, and the, with, with the baseline preference of the two foods. And in fact, when we inactivated OFC, we saw an ablation of this cor correlation. Basically, animals were shifting their preferences from day one to day two, but um, but these these shifts in preferences no longer correlated or no longer depended on their on their baseline preference. Um, so this just shows the data uh, in the format of a psychometric curve, and uh, this light gray is the day one behavior. Uh, the pink here shows sessions in which the um, non-preferred pellet was pre-fed, and you can see these significant shifts away from that pellet. These are about 40% shifts in preference, which are pretty substantial. Um, even though, you know, we, it might not look huge on the psychometric curve, but we, the range of this uh, psychometric curve shows from one to eight to eight to one. Those would be pretty sizable shifts in preference. The shifts towards the pre-fed pellet when the pre-fed pellet was preferred are, are certainly smaller, but you can see a pretty big difference between, between the two um, directions here. And finally, when we inactivated OFC, you can see that, um, that this effect was ablated. In fact, the yellow line here corresponds to the gray line over here. So if anything, they were going even in opposite directions from the control behavior. So um, to conclude, basically this suggests that be, the behavior is goal-directed since it is revaluation sensitive, um, indicating that orbital frontal cortex appears to be necessary specifically when uh, not for the um, not for the goal-directed behavior itself, but for updating or updates to outcomes um, that on the task. So just to summarize up to, uh, up to now, we have developed an economic choice task in rodents similar to those used with monkeys. 
an activation of the lateral and medial portions of OFC during the Q period of the task, I'm not sure if I mentioned that before, uh, has no effect on economic choice, but an activation was effective in disrupting devaluation sensitive behavior in a Pavlovian task in the same animals. I didn't show you the medial data, but we also inactivated medial orbital frontal cortex and found no significant effect on the behavior. And finally, uh, the task is sensitive to reinforcer uh, revaluation through satiety, uh, and this effect uh, indeed depends on OFC. So this last finding really indicated to us that, that OFC isn't necessary for model-based behavior, but it is necessary for incorporating new information into decisions. And perhaps an example that illustrates this idea is that if you're driving down the road and on the radio you hear that uh, M&Ms have been recalled and you're shopping for Halloween candy later that night, you need to take in that information about the M&M recall and update your decision um, to, to, to make sure that you're not choosing uh, the, the wrong food or a, a food that might make you sick when you're later deciding between what Halloween candy to get. So this ended up putting us sort of in a place um, where we thought orbital frontal cortex function was not quite like what we had previously been supporting uh, that OFC is important for use of a cognitive map. And it also put us more towards uh, um, what those, but what you guys have some of you have suggested in that uh, orbital frontal cortex is necessary for uh, credit assignment. So we sort of thought that our, these results are some, falling somewhere in the middle. We've taken this to, to mean that maybe orbital frontal cortex is important for updating uh, a cognitive map rather than using it. And to try to, I think an example that best explains what I mean by this is when Explorers were first coming to the new world. They had a really uh, poor map of what this world looked like, the new world looked like. And they could still use this uh, very raw map to make basic inferences. For instance, if you look at Florida here, they could still use this map to get a sense of how far away Florida was from, say, Chile. Um, yet, it wasn't quite accurate. But as explorers brought information back to the cartographers or the map makers, over time they were able to update these maps and make them more useful or make them uh, uh, more connected to uh, actual observations or reality. Until finally they had uh, very accurate maps. So specifically this idea that orbital frontal cortex might be important for updating cognitive maps that we, we wanted to further uh, address. So we thought that the economic choice task was a good uh, place to do this since rats have are using a good space in order to make decisions. So in our well-trained animals, rats have been choosing between these different food pellets quite often. So they should have a really good sense of this good space. And this is demonstrated in their uh, consistent, their transitive behavior. They really understand how these uh, pellets relate to one another. So we wanted to know what would happen if we introduced two new foods into uh, the animal's uh, good space. So uh, we did this by introducing two new foods that we trained against each other. And we wanted to know uh, whether orbital frontal cortex was required for the first time that they made decisions between these new foods in this more established food space. So we first trained two new Q outcome pairs and we trained them against each other. Uh, this shows six days of training of these new Q outcome associations. And what you can see is the animals start out with a one-to-one -one indifference point, indicating no preference for either of the pellets. In fact, uh, overall, the, uh, the peanut butter pellets were um, more preferred on average uh, across these rats. And you can see this preference develop over the course of the six days of training. 
You can also see that the, the slope starts out flatter and ends up slightly steeper over these six days of training. So after these six days of training of these two cues against each other, we wanted to then look at whether orbital frontal cortex was required for the first time that animals chose uh, these new foods in reference to these more established food space. So to do this, on the first day of these, what we're referring to as novel pairs, uh, the laser was turned on for all the trials for both the control and experimental conditions. And then on day two, we turned the laser off. And the, our question was, how quickly would their behavior reach stable, uh, their behavior on day one reach the stable, stable behavior of day two? So we took a bunch of well-experienced um, pairs. So from our, uh, uh, from the, the foods that are the pairs that were well, well trained. And you can see that what I'm plotting here is a moving, a 44 trial moving window over the course of the session. The light yellow is the first 44 trials and uh, the dark color are the last 44 trials. And you can see that the behavior uh, remains very stable. So on the x-axis here is I'm, I'm showing you the absolute change in preference from day one to day two. And um, on the y-axis, I'm, I'm showing you the change in slope from day one to day two. And uh, this just shows the change in slope and the change in the difference point broken out over time. And you can just see that they're very stable in these well-experienced pairs. Now, when we first introduced these novel experienced pairs that I, just, that I was just telling you about, you can see that it takes the animals a little bit longer to reach stable behavior in this case, indicating that there's some kind of reorient, what we're thinking might be re reorientation of the space as they're seeing these pellets um, in reference to each other for the first time. Now, when we inactivate lateral off C, we see a really large disruption in this uh, approach to stable behavior on the first day. Uh, you can see this in the uh, a, a flattening of the slope as well as uh, non, not well-established preferences on day one. Now, interestingly, we also inactivated medial OFC and we saw no effect in this example. We Basically, the animals showed uh, very similar behavior to the uh, novel experience controls. Now, to go back and look at just the lateral OFC guys, the question was, well, um, when we were inactivating here, were we actually seeing, was this specific to this first day of behavior, this effect specific to the first time that they were choosing these novel pairs? And so we put the animals back on uh, the pellet pairs, gave them a little bit more experience on these novel pairs uh, to, so that they had what we're referring to as mild experience. And what you can see is just a few more days of experience um, on these pairs that if we inactivate OFC at this point, we no longer see this disruption in behavior. And this really suggests to us that lateral orbital frontal cortex is really required for establishing or uh, setting up uh, animals to appropriately decide between new in, uh, these new pairs or in new situations. This has led us to think that um, orbital frontal cortex is uh, more likely to be important for updating a cognitive map than for use of a cognitive map as uh, proposed by Wilson et al. So with that, um, I just wanna go into some of the current and future directions that we're doing. And I think probably the first question that I had after seeing these results is, whether OFC is actually doing anything differently um, in this situation where uh, animals, uh, where the behavior requires OFC. It could be that OFC is doing the same thing in the well-experienced pairs as in these novel pairs, but somehow downstream areas are reading out OFC differently in these cases. Um, the other question that we had is whether uh, the specific outcome representations um, within OFC are maintained across sessions. And this really gets at a separate question of whether the animal's orbital frontal cortex is 
referencing some type of more broad good space. Or um, the other possibility is that orbital frontal cortex is really more doing what the original cognitive map hypothesis was suggesting and is sort of doing the, uh, performing the task on a daily basis. So uh, to better explain this, it's possible that neurons in OFC might represent the more preferred option and the less preferred option on any given session, or they might be representing the specific outcome representations of the foods. And you can see this if you looked across multiple sessions to see if when um, a pellet is preferred or not pre preferred, whether the same representation is maintained. Um, a paper that came out a few years ago suggesting that OFC does remap to uh, encode the more preferred and less preferred option. But we think we can get at this question in a little bit more detail if we, using calcium imaging, since we can presumably track the same neurons across many sessions and we can um, look at whether these representations are stable for different food types or whether there does appear to be this re remapping. So we're currently working on that. This is uh, an example of uh, some calcium imaging that in, within OFC that we've been doing. Um, this is using single photon calcium imaging. So these are awake behaving rats in the task and we have uh, a mini scope attached to the animal's head. And you can see this is the raw data on the left, and these are the extracted calcium uh, signals of different neurons on the right. And you can see the rat down here is performing the task, and you see every once in a while a trial comes on. This is sped up about four times. That's why the, the screens are only on for a short amount of time. And finally, the last thing that I'm working on is whether these processes are disrupted in addiction. Currently at National Institute of uh, uh, on drug addiction or drug abuse. So uh, it's obvious that we want to, we're sort of curious about whether this might, these processes might be disrupted. Right now we're looking at whether uh, transitive behavior uh, is somehow disrupted in animals that are self-administering drugs of abuse, uh, in particular cocaine. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the lab, uh, Jeff, my advisor, and as well as uh, Jessica Conroy and David Sanchez, who helped me run a lot of these experiments. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Matteo, for the fantastic talk. It was great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so please uh, come forward with your questions. Uh, you can either just turn on your video audio or you can just uh, drop, drop a message in the chat room. Uh, so I think while I'm waiting for everyone to ask to come up with a question, can we go to that slide with the, when you made the novel pairs? Yes. Uh, so I think I don't know if you mentioned here or was it in your paper already that you also tested with having the novel offers combination. Yeah, I, I should have I should have included that in the talk. I'm always worried whether I have enough time to uh, go into that. Yeah, I think you have enough time now, so maybe you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I should have put, you know, I didn't, unfortunately in this talk, I didn't include any of the novel offer slides at the end. So I'll just ex try to explain, to, explain it then. Um, so we also looked at whether um, behavior is disrupted in novel offers. And the, the, what we were thinking at, um, was that we weren't sure whether animals were using specific um, cached values of the patterns uh, displayed to the animal on each trial, right? So on each trial, an animal is getting stimulus A, stimulus B on, on either screen, and say there's one of A and two of B. Uh, animals could learn specific values for the pattern of one of A versus two of B. And uh, rather than using some kind of uh, cash value comparator or even a model-based approach, um, we saw we we pitched our uh, pitched the paper in terms of um, testing these hypotheses. So, so novel offers were situations in which the animals were choosing between numbers of pellets that they had never seen before. So, in the example that I'm showing here, um, unfortunately, I don't have a single session example. 
we were always having the animals choose some number versus one of one of the pellets. And for the novel um, offers experiment, we looked at when the animal was choosing, say, four of pellet A versus three of pellet B, or eight of pellet A versus three of pellet B. And the animals had never seen these ratios, uh, particular uh, numerical ratios before. So um, the question was, could they perform well on these novel offers? And in fact, they did. They had no problem um, performing just these, the behavior basically fit very close to the uh, sigmoid for the novel offer uh, trials. And perhaps not surprisingly, I mean, of course, this indicated that they couldn't be just using cash values to the particular patterns of uh, the stimuli, um, but it could still be a cash value comparator. Um, we sort of suggest that maybe it's not a cash value comparator first by uh, our observations that the task is revaluation sensitive. And second, um, we thought that a cash cash values would not likely update on these novel pairs. That these novel pairs to us indicate that animals are really referencing some type of, um, of, of good space when they're making these decisions. I don't know if that explains, uh, explains that well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for the explanation. So first yeah. uh, question from Matthew. Um, hi there. So um, very, very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering how you uh, how you were thinking about this good space because so uh, you know uh, you use the example of, uh, of, of a cognitive map and you know typically in a cognitive map there are uh, you would be you would need one because there are multiple dimensions that you would have to be thinking about. So what sort of how does that translate more specifically into the type of situation that you're looking at? Yeah, that, I think that's a great question. And I, in my mind, I would say it's still somewhat hazy, but I will explain to you the, the level of detail that I think I understand this, this map to be. So first of all, I think it does not fall into um, uh, the Wilson et al. or Yael Niv kind of explanation of what a cognitive map is simply because I'm not picturing this as a state space um, type of map, although I'm sure you could formalize it this way. Instead, I'm thinking of this as um, a feature space of the different foods. So um, I'm not sure what that feature space would exactly be. Uh, I, so just to give you a little background on myself, my, um, my PhD was focused in uh, chemo sensation. And so I guess I was thinking of this more from a chemosensory space that there might be uh, dimensions of different flavors, dimensions of different tastes, such as sucrose salt, uh, uh, the level of acidity, uh, the le level of bitterness. And you could imagine this larger space within these chemosensory dimensions. Um, and that this is the underlying space that OFC is trying to manipulate or try to understand how these stimuli come to represent um, some location in this uh, chemosensory space. Uh, I don't know if that if that sort of if that gets at the uh, question. Yeah, no, it does. It does. It's a very direct and interesting suggestion. Uh, I mean, you know, I can see, um, I, I can see that one dimension that you have in your experiment as well is just the amount of the different foodstuffs that's manipulated explicitly. So I could see how you could maybe begin to manipulate one of these other dimensions that you've mentioned just now in tandem with it. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it sounds like an interesting suggestion. Thank you. You know, I, I would also just like to add that our, I think our proposition is not that, I wanna say it's not that novel, it's, to me, it's sort of combining the idea of cognitive maps with more something more can do credit assignment hypothesis that there's something special that OFC is important for updating. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's it's also updating uh, the, the, the map itself, uh, which um, it could, I don't know, I, you could get into the details of how that is different from credit, you know, credit assignment hypothesis per se. Yeah, yeah, I know, I see, I see what you mean. I can, to see how you can link those ideas very, 
very well in the experiment. Yeah, thanks. Yep, uh, Lawrence. Hi there, um, thanks for, for a great talk. Um, oh, I just had a, a couple of questions of kind of more relating to your, your first two studies. Um, so um, I, I, I thought it was really interesting the uh, analysis that you did on the second study of for shifts in indifference space based upon the preference that the animal had um, in, in um, uh, the pre-existing okay. preference. And I was wondering whether that same thing, you, you tried that same thing with the original um, analysis and, and it hadn't worked or whether there was some way in which you couldn't perform that analysis in the, in the first data set. Oh, you're saying with looking at the uh, the, his, the histograms? Yeah, exactly. So, so I think you were, you, were, you were saying that in the first study, um, there wasn't a shift in the indifference point um, based upon the histograms, but but then, yeah. but then you showed us this nice data saying saying well it's it's shifting based upon the pre-existing preference of the animal. So, um. Yeah. So so yeah, if you look at the histograms, there would be a, a significant shift. Um, I probably you know now that you say that, I had never really thought about the um, not presenting this stuff within the same same way. It does seem sort of strange. Maybe I should do that. You know, one thing that I would like to point out, though, is um, um, as you can see here on this plot, there aren't a, a there aren't a su there isn't a su super substantial n here for um, say the um, preference for the non preferred and preferred, and that's basically because we didn't actually expect to see this um, correlation of the pre feeding with the baseline preference. So, um, so we ended up with you know a lower n than one would hope to have, uh, even though our n overall was pretty substantial. Um, once you break it down into preferred, non-preferred, then we ended up with you know a lower number here. And certainly, though, if you compare uh, the histogram of these pink circles with the green, you would see that they're split. The histograms just are not as impressive in this case because the n's are a lot lower. Um, we did consider just combining the pink with the green and then inverting the um, the yellow dots with the gray dots. But then I, I, we, we even might have had that in the original uh, manuscript, but I, we might have, I, I sort of think one of the uh, reviewers didn't like that we were combining the two opposite things, so they had us get rid of that. Um, but uh, but anyway, yeah. So so that means it it, it is really specific to, to this this situation. And so, and so I guess I, I a more kind of broad question. I I like the idea of like integrating the the, the role that the OFC might be playing is, is in kind of like integrating new information into the decision. Um, but I, I I I guess I sometimes think about decisions that unfold in, in a natural way as also containing that property. Um, like so. Um, so, so, so in you, in your case, you're integrating information based upon like um, changes in in uh, motivation for certain certain reinforcers based upon you know like pre feeding. But when you're making a naturalistic decision, you might form a preference, and then you might get new information as your as as, as the decision unfolds. Like you know, like I don't know, you, you look at the ingredients as you're uh, on the back of a a packet in yeah. the supermarket and that changes your preference. And so I'm wondering if you think that there's anything distinct between uh, integrating information from your, your, your past and from, from memory versus integrating information which you're, you're kind of currently attending to. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I actually, I really had been focusing more on integrating information from the past. That said, I mean, a lot of the evidence that is out there, we're, and the proposition that we've recently suggested in our review is that um, that all of this integration of past information is done real time, and it's done at the time of the decision. Yeah, okay. yeah, because that's when you're when you're inactivating, right? And, and you're... Yeah, exactly. And yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, it also was the only. It was the best way to try to re understand how devaluation um, effects of obser observations of devaluation would sort of fit with this idea. Because I think previously a lot of people had thought that, well, um, evaluation indicates that or orbital frontal cortex is important for um, representing or use of model-based information or goal-directed information, not updating. 
But if you consider the update at the time of the use at the extinction probe or the, the final probe that you're looking at it, then um, then it is you know a real time incorporation of that um, of that information. So so I guess if I think of it that way, then I wouldn't be surprised if it would be both incorporating um, you know explicit information with with the more uh, historical or memory uh, type information that would be available. Um, so uh, so just to sort of go off what you were saying, you know, I recently realized that um, uh, we could analyze our um, ah, um, our the first. So we actually train the animals on each of the pellets versus cellulose to when they first learn before we go into specific pairs. And when they show really strong preference for each of the food types. Um, uh, we then put them on each of the food, the real food pairs for the first time. And I recently realized I could go back and analyze these first sessions, the first time they had ever chosen a, any of the foods against each other versus against cellulose. So in this case, they know that they've experienced the cues in the foods quite a bit before these first time pairs. And what's surprising is that you sort of see the first time that they choose something um, when you analyze it the same way as the novel pairs, um, the behavior is very disrupted on the first session that they ever choose something. And it almost looks like they're taking time to establish this preference space. And the reason I'm bringing that up is it sort of goes to what you were saying about, you know, experiencing things in real time with, you know, sort of covert attention that even though this is memory that they're using based on you know these stimuli um, it almost seems like they're think I from my observations it, it seems like the first time that they make these decisions they realize they hadn't really ever thought about these things the in that way before and maybe that just bringing up the representations and thinking about them is almost actually a you know more covert or explicit type of way of uh, of thinking about this rather than as memory yeah. um, uh, as that's, that's a super cool effect. I, um, but, um, I should let, let us. So I see some other people are trying to ask questions as well in the chat. So I oh, okay. Get in. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Alan, I don't know if you want to ask your own question or if I should read your question. Uh, no, I'm happy to ask. Yeah. Um, so I can turn my view. Hi from Fimrit. Um So um, yeah, I was wondering. So the the general idea of um first of all amazing like really cool talk really cool stuff oh, thank you appreciate it um so uh, the it seemed to me that in this was is very similar to dorothy's dorothy says um work uh, back in like 2011 or even before about uh, the role of medial prefrontal cortex and pre prelimbic in assimilating um, new information into an existing schema. Only, yes. only there the schema is spatial, whereas here the schema is in goods space. Um, and it seems like very, very similar. And I was wondering if you can, um, it, what, what, what do you think like a prelimbic um, in, uh, inhibition would do here? Or like, is the, re is the reason why oh, lateral OFC here is the, like oh, the difference between lateral OFC and prelimbic um, in this context and whether it's because we are in good space that lateral RFC is important here and value is important and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I, I, that last ob observation might might be an important facet. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it certainly is really well connected to uh, chemosensory areas. Um, that said, and maybe you can answer this. I So I've been trying to understand how schemas would fit on this task. It, it's almost like the rats are using the space, and it's, say you have two new foods that they've never experienced. They they know the space, but would you would it be a schema then within you know? I guess in my mind, it's maybe you're dropping down to a particular hyperplane. You're projecting um, the uh, whatever whatever two foods are um, that you're choosing between in the space and looking at this hyperplane and trying to make decisions. 
maybe that hyperplane is a, would be somewhat synonymous with a schema or something. I, mm -hmm. I, I've actually had a hard time trying to understand how how um, that type of thinking relates to this task. And to be honest, I, I really um, I've had I've had a hard time, and I, it might be just me <laughs> hard time like, understanding that. Yeah, um, no, it's a good question. Your argument is not as straightforward as I. Uh, um, I yeah. I, that said, I completely agree with you. I, I, um, <laughs> I, it, it's certainly possible that other prefrontal areas would be important for this, um, and it might be that this that aspect of it uh, would be certain aspects of this breakdown into this, say the hyperplane that you'd be choosing on any given session might depend on, um, on other regions as well. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know the answer to that. And I, I should probably go back and try to, to try to better understand how the two things relate because, because obviously schemas and cognitive maps are, are highly related to Very related, one. exactly, yeah. A schema is just a specific instantiation of the map uh, in, my, in my mind. Um, so obviously it has to connect to this. I just haven't understood exactly how it does. Cool, thanks very much. Yep. Uh, thanks. Uh, Maya, do you want to ask your question or should I read it for you? Uh, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, I was mainly just wondering how you see this relating to addiction, as you said, on future direction. That uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. So so the experiment that we're doing now is um, we're trying to look at whether uh, first whether uh, animals that have undergone ex extensive um, uh, self-administration of a drug of abuse have either disrupted transitivity, which I'm sort of, it's sort of, I have some of the data now and it looks like their behavior, their transitive behavior is disrupted, meaning that they can't consistently choose across these different food types. And the other possibility is they might be disrupted on the novel pairs. Um, I haven't actually gotten to that experiment yet, but um, our thoughts are that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that orbital frontal cortex um, activity is disrupted in addiction and our thoughts are that maybe somehow um, the, uh, the use of this type of space is, uh, of, a, of a cognitive map is just not appropriate in a, appropriately used in addiction. And so, um, uh, which would explain, um, you know, irrational choice that, uh, that people with, who, uh, who have problems with addiction um, might have. Um, so we were thinking that maybe this would explain why uh, some decisions are rational, whereas other decisions do appear to be rational. It might be specifically these cases of inference that are uh, that are disrupted within addiction. Uh, so that's that's the direction that we're trying to get at, and we're really close. I, I um, I'm hoping that we do see you know some kind of um, disruption in the in transitivity or the novel pairs in this case. Thank you. Yep.